So good morning. <coughs> From today we are going to start researching the inner light of Hanukkah. To understand Hanukkah, I will begin with a personal anecdote. Today we live in a world filled with forces preparing for war, world wars, with non-conventional weapons. And Europe itself is in a turmoil. The spirit of neo-Nazism and anti-Semitism is increasing. This reminds me when I was a youngster. I was only aged 10 when the war began. And we were evacuated from London. We had our home. My father, Lava Shalom, he worked in the centre of town. He had his business there as a continental lawyer. And that was the centre of the Blitz, which came in that dark winter, when England stood alone. And I remember, near the time of Hanukkah, in December, we listened to the words of Churchill, when England stood alone against the forces of evil and were suffering from constant bombardment from the, <coughs> the, the, <coughs> the empire of hate and destruction being prepared by Hitler and Marchemont. So Churchill, who was a strong believer in Hashem and God, he said in his speech, which I remember to this day, when he said, we are today fighting against the enemy, I can't say his exact words, but it's recorded, and he said, we have to look to the Maccabeans, who in a time when they were being subjected to religious persecution, and they were being <coughs> annihilated, many of them, in their land. It says in the book of the Maccabeans, that Matijau arose and he said, even if all the people will go after the other gods, yet will I and my family and those that want to join me, we will fight for our God and for our land and for my brothers. Then he said, if the Jewish people then had not rallied around Matityahu and Yehuda Maccabi to defend moral civilization against the force of corruption and evil, then there would be no moral civilization left today for all mankind and let us take courage from their example. And though we are facing powers of evil and powers of hate with the Axis, we will put our trust in God and take an example from them to continue the battle. That was his message. And what is it to go back to? He said, if, if, if he could have went on, he said, if they wouldn't have rallied at that time, who knows if there would have been anything left of morality in the world? Who knows if Christianity would have developed? 
and moral civilization. So today also we have to battle. If you know Churchill, he recognized throughout his leadership of the Allies, like also Eisenhower, that they were acting on behalf of God and they had constant providence to ultimately bring about the destruction of the Nazi beast. And today we see the Nazi beast arising again, unfortunately, allied to the Muslim beast. We're not talking about Muslims who believe in morality, but those Muslims who believe in hate and destruction and murder and suicide, who are endangering the whole of civilization. Therefore, at such a time, the light of Hanukkah in the darkness and the coldness of the present world situation, there's almost a cold war now going on, between, even between the East and the West, between Russia and the States. And certainly there's a type of cold war going on between Iran and the Western powers which is endangering the, call it the threshold, referred to by the prophet, the threshold of poison, we would say today, the threshold of creating an explosion in the world. And the center of all the troubles is right here in Jerusalem. So therefore this is the time when we have to repeat what it mentions in last week's Pasha, that Hakol Kol Yaakov Ayedai Mite Esav. The question of the future of mankind is, is might going to be right, or is right going to be might? Are we going to have as our future universal, basic, principle of civilization power, who's got the strongest power? Or are we going to have a space of civilization who is pursuing justice and kindness and who is trying to destroy it? And this is what is referred to in the words, the voice, the voice of justice and kindness is the voice of Yaakov. And the voice of Esav is the voice of power. I had died with the Esau, but called Kol Yaakov. Also referred to in the phrase Al Khar Khatichye. Some live by the sword. And the Cherev does not just mean the sword, it means destruction. It means ruins. To make the world into ruins. Through destruction. Or we can build up a beautiful world as outlined in our Torah as outlined in the Torah for all mankind, universal code. Now that's the question. And let's put it right in the symbol of the state of Israel, which is the menorah. And we know Hanukkah has a lot to do with the menorah. So that's the concept which is referred to in the book of the prophecy of Zechariah. This was in the beginning of the Second Temple period, which was also the period during which we had the battle between the corrupt, idolatrous Hellenists and the courageous uprising of the Maccabeans who came out with the state, Mil Hashem Eli, who's going to ally himself with Hashem, who is the quality of loving kindness and morality. So that is referred to in the words of the prophetic vision to Zechariah concerning the Second Temple period, where 
במהלך סתם, ואת לא בחי ולא בכוח כי הם ברוכים. The second temple is going to survive in the whole period in the land of Israel together with the remnants of the people of Israel and having the second temple it has to be based not upon power and not upon strength but only upon my spirit says Hashem and that was the word interpretation of the symbol of the golden menorah which came out from an olive tree. For the olives is the fuel that produces light and warmth to represent the light and warmth of the Torah of Hashem. And this is what will bring the redemption, but not strength. Lo b'chayv, lo and that's the symbol of the state of Israel. The question is, is it also today, is it really being followed, the symbol? Do we recognize the enormous importance as the essence of the difference between Jew and Gentile? It's far removed from any racial or ethnic superiority. It's because the Jewish people, the essence is the light, the enlightenment, the spiritual teaching. But if you start using Chayel and Koach, that light will become dimmed and maybe even extinguished, as in fact happened <coughs> that during the Second Temple period. There were ups and downs in the extent to which the government in Israel, the monarchies, were following the spiritual teachings. Because well, some of them did start believing in the superiority of Chayel and Koach as being more important than the spirit. And that's the big question that we can only solve by increasing the light today. So in order to understand this more deeply, there are not so many passages which describe the ups and downs of the Hasmonean dynasty and the battles that took place. Although it, there are obvious the many records available, four books of Maccabeans and other Midrashim, that describe the Second Temple period quite thoroughly. But to understand its significance, we should go to the Gemara, which is on page 21b in Shabbos, and I brought you a punctuated text. And I want to do it to me with the Hebrew. Everybody should understand the significance of a very short passage which contains very deep teachings. And the passage is my Chanukah, which you find in front of you. What is Chanukah? First of all, let me ask you the question. What does the word Chanukah mean? Can you tell me? Dedication. Huh? Dedication? Yes, dedication of what? Of the temple. Huh? Of the temple. Dedication of the temple. Because the temple had become impure and was rededicated. And also resting. Huh? Resting. Resting? Yeah. Um. Yes. Now there's a hint here. If you divide the word Hanukkah into two, it's Hanu. Hanu means they encamped, they rested. Ko means the, in this manner. What came to rest? What came to rest? The battle. The fighting. They were able to remove the power of the Maccabeans and therefore, with the dedication and purification of the temple, in which there had been idols set, so they removed the idols, they removed the impurity. 
and the people of Israel felt more at rest. It was at least a ceasefire. There were still some battles going on, but it was easier. But it ought to hint here to Chonu Chafei. You divide the word Chonu, they encamped, and then you have Chafei. And what does Chafei refer to? 25. Huh? Chafei is numerically 25. And what's special about 25? Well, no. I suppose all of you know in America, it's, it's even everywhere. Generation. In, in, uh, in my experience, I went to America around about this time. Oh, it's, Everywhere it's you base. went, it's a base. It spoke about the 25th of September. Of December. Oh, Christmas. What the 25th of Christmas. December? No, yes. And what the 25th of Kislev? It's, 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 it's the date of Hanukkah. Today we're the 9th of Kislev. The redemption day for the Chabad. And we have, no, no, that's the 19th. No, Mitle Rebbe, the son of the Parasanya. All sent parts here, okay. That means you. So Chav Hei is a reference to the 25th of Kislev. It's an important date. And you know in America there, there, are, there are Jews who celebrate both. You know, they think they can celebrate 25th of December and 25th of Kislev. And there's some, even some synagogues in America where they have an Xmas tree and a Hanukkah menorah. Anyway, that's Hanukkah. So, my Hanukkah. Now, when the Gemara said my Hanukkah, does it mean they didn't know it? The, the, the Amurahim, that means the later scholars, they didn't know what Hanukkah was. Of course they knew. They knew what it was. They knew it was the celebration <coughs> of the rededication of the temple and specifically of what? The menorah. Of the menorah. We have to understand also why the menorah is so important. But Rashi, look at Rashi. Rashi says, on my Hanukkah, person uh, here, person doesn't show you all the Rashi here. On the other side. So Rashi says, Al Eze Nes Kavua. For which miracle did they celebrate Hanukkah? Because the truth is, if you look at the book of the Maccabeans, and even if you look at the prayer which we say in the Bekat Amazon, Greece after meals, and in the daily prayer of Hanukkah, it doesn't really mention explicitly just the kindling of the lights of the menorah in the, in the temple. It meant because there were so many miracles. And it emphasizes that Hanukkah is the time when the, the, the Hellenistic spirit became of Alexander the Great, who had the wisdom of the Greeks on a high level. And uh, we can see from many things told about him, he, had a, he recognized there's a god of all the gods, well, they also worshipped the other gods. But he recognized the superiority of the religion of the Jews. When he went to remove barbarism and uh, the gross idolatry on a lower level than the high level of the Greeks amongst the nations, both in Asia and Africa and part of Europe that he conquered, when he came to the state of Judea, and he recognized the greatness of the priesthood and also of the wise men, and he entered into debates with them. He decided he's giving the whole Jewish people complete religious freedom to worship their God. But underneath he felt that they really knew the truth, like Aristotle also felt. Aristotle's teacher was also a believer in one God. And that's what he taught him, basically. 
And there they are, there are other gods, but the, the, the other gods are more symbolic. And the true God is a spiritual one. And uh, especially as we see there's a discussion at the end of the tractate Tamid, which deals with the daily offering of the temple, of the debate that took place in Alexander the Great and the wise men of the South. And it would appear that he was very highly impressed by the truth of their answers to questions that he still had, even after having absorbed the teachings of Aristotle. And so he gave freedom in his whole empire to the pursuit of the Jewish religion, recognizing therein the greatest wisdom. And that's why until today, Alexander is a Jewish name, named after him. But when he died, and his empire was divided into four parts, as also prophesied by Daniel, the, emp the emp empire will develop that way, four parts, and all those four groups all went back to cruel and even murderous types of religions. And the, the, the ones who were Ptolemy were a bit better. The Ptolemies were in charge of the Egyptian uh, part of the empire. The Ptolemies tried to build up the largest library in the world, which it was in their time. And they also had the translation made of the Hebrew Bible. So they were a bit more tolerant of the Jewish people. But it also brought about quite a lot of assimilation amongst the Jews who lived there. But the ones who were in charge, like Antiochus, over Judea, they brought about a complete subjection of the people if they followed the Greek paths and were willing to go and participate with the Hellenistic sport, which demanded nudity, and they were very much against the, the circumcision, the Mila, and they were very much against eating specific diets that say you've got to be like us, you've got to also worship our idols, you don't do so, you'll be killed. And they started making a religious war against Jewish observance. So these, these things were well known, and they are extant until today, so many records. Many of them translated into Greek, and later into Latin, and today it was in English. And some of them included what's called the Sfarim Chitzoniim, which were some texts which dealt with the historical phenomena. So then we can understand this question, my Hanukkah. As Rashi says, not my Hanukkah what it was, but we knew what it had to do with the victory of the Asmoneans over the Hellenists. The question is, why do we, what, which way do we celebrate it? On which aspect of this important period, a critical period for the survival of Judaism and the Jewish people, so on what aspect do we celebrate it? So it's like this. The Hasmoneans, they were able to expel the Syrian Greeks from the temple environs. To give you the date, the miracle of Hanukkah occurred in 165 before the Common Era. That's 3597. The war continued, would continue another generation until 140 before the Common Era. Then the Sanhedrin, the people, proclaimed Shimon, the last surviving son of Matityahu, Ben Yochanan, to be their prince we like their king. But what is the Gemara's question was Hanukkah? What is the miracle that was the basis for the establishment of this festival? Now, then there's brought here a brighter, the Tanu Rabbanan. And this is 
an old an old writer which mentioned later the old writer is the Begilatanit. We know the mission was compiled by whom? By the When did he live? Approximately the second century. Second century of the common era. Hanukkah took place a few hundred years before. But then there was also the oral law. Now the oral law had to be learned by heart and was generally not recorded. That explains when you're learning Mishnah, the Mishnah is very short, each word has significance. It had to be learned by heart. And the discussion of it is left to the Gomorrah, that's Gomorrah learning. And here I perhaps I want to explain something quite important, especially for beginners in Torah learning. I want to explain that the mitzvah of learning Torah we say every day is in the first passage of the Shema. Do any of you know the verse which says you've got to learn Torah? What does the verse say? Huh? Which pasuk of the Shema? Oh, it says that you have to learn Torah? Yes. Uh, first one. Pun? First, the, the mother's the command, they've been your, your heart. That's the second Pasha, yes. But the first Pasha of Shema yeah. also is mentioned. So, your heart, it's been your you heart. You should teach the Torah, the very Ma'il is a reference to the Torah. These words of the Torah should be upon you, in your mind. How do you bring them to your mind? Vishinantam Lebanecha. Then you should teach them to your sons. And the oral tradition, and that is, sons means real sons, and it means those who should be like your real sons, your students. So the learning of Torah is introduced to teaching Torah. So every Jew has to regard himself as a teacher. So it says it, but it applies to every Jew, we say it every day. Every Jew is a teacher, potentially. A teacher to his children. If he doesn't have children, or the children already know, they already know everything, know a lot, they do what their own children to see to. You have to teach Jews who know less than you. You've learned something? You have to teach to somebody else. This was the essence of the people of Israel, is not that we regard Noah as our forefather. Noah, he was a very saintly man, but he did not become a teacher. He didn't do enough in the eyes of Hashem to teach others, he t or to teach his children, as he was able to do in part. His son Shem, he was able to teach the others. He didn't he really, really teach them enough. And it says he was partly guilty for the, for the deluge because he didn't teach his generation enough. He could become a great teacher. Should have worked harder. Although he was very saintly. But in fact, he's referred to as somebody actually went with God, but not in front of God. And the Jews got to go in front of God like Abraham Avinu. He's got to show the way. He's got to bring God in us to the rest of the world, like Abraham did. That's our inheritance. And that's what we have to do as Jews, to spread Torah far and wide. So uh, that's very important. But we were given a Torah, in order to teach, you've got to really understand, you've got to work hard, and use your mind. You can't teach someone else unless you've absorbed the teachings in your heart and analyzed them in your mind. That's the basic principle of teaching. So why does it mention teaching first? The, then it follows on, the debate of bomb, you yourself have to speak about it, wherever you are. And the debate of bomb, from there you learn out, learning Torah. Of course, you've got to learn Torah. Because if you haven't learned it, you can't teach it. But there's something deeper. Vishinantam 
It's an unusual expression. In fact, one of the nuns has a dagesh chazak. It's a dot in the middle. And with the letter of the Chumash, a dot in the middle, what does it mean? If it's in any of the letters, we're not speaking about, there are seven letters, Begat Kafas, six or seven letters, and seven, but one which sometimes, where it refers to a different type of pronunciation. But when it's in any of the other letters, of the consonants, what does the Dagesh in the letter mean? It's double. It's double. So therefore, Vishenantam contains two noons and contains every, actually three noons. They were the sages say, Hashem asked us to divide our learning into three parts. What are three parts? One is the written Torah where we have to reckon each word as being prophetic, being a word from Hashem on different levels, like Chumash Taylor level for the Nevim Kusuvim. But nevertheless, it's the text. The text is a holy text. And then there's the oral tradition, which is not a text, which you have to learn by heart. The oral tradition was passed on from teacher to disciple, you have to learn it. And the Torah Shavuapeh is brief, it, but it can be expanded. But, it's, but the text itself, you have to memorize, is brief. And then it says, this is the oral tradition that goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu that you also have to add Gomorrah. Now what does Gomorrah mean by Moshe Rabbeinu? The Gomorrah we have today, the Talmud of Bavli, was written a few thousand years after the giving of the Torah. But it's a record of the discussions. And some of the discussions go back right to the beginning. The actual Torah Shebaal Peh were, were things which were memorized and short. And that not only which were given originally to Moshe Rabbeinu, but also developed by the sages, short decisions or short record. That's the Mishnah and that's the Brighter. Brighter means outside because it reference to any compilations of Torah Shibam Peh, which are not included in the compilation of Huda Nasi. Some say it would not see himself in his time was written down. Others say it was written down even later. This time it was still partly memorized. But the Megillah Tanit, which describes Hanukkah, is called a scroll. This was a scroll which contained all the laws of the Jewish year, the Jewish calendar. And that they permitted to be written down because it was needed by every person to know uh, which days are Yontav, which days you're allowed to mourn, which days you're not allowed to mourn, which days are festivals. So this is the Megillah Tanis which describes Hanukkah, which we'll have in a few minutes. Now why do I mention this? Because, it's because the essence of Gomorrah is to use one's head and one's heart to discuss and see what's the real meaning and what is the analysis, both of all the laws of the Torah, whether written or oral, as well as what are all the basic principles, like Pika Avot is, is Mishnah, principles of life, and to understand them more deeply. And here is a question of free discussion. And that is very important because we as Jews were the people of the book, we are tied to the book of the Tanakh. We are tied to the oral teachings given by Hashem. We're tied to the decisions made by the sages. That's all part of the concept of Mishnah. But Hashem says, you are not to be a nation that just, as it were, blindly accepts what's written, memorizes what it is, accepts what no by tradition, and carries it. And one of the great uh, commentators says, when he discusses certain things, he says, I don't want to be like a donkey who is carrying a lot of books. Other the Jew has to use his mind. We believe not in blind faith, in seeing faith. You've got to try to understand it. And that's written in the Chumash. When the Chumash begins to give laws for the people of Israel on the first Pesach, it says you're going to have children who ask questions. You've got to know how to answer them. 
of the questioning and answering is the basis of the development of the Jewish mind and the development of teaching. How can you, we're not supposed to just teach it by rote, be, be carrying an encyclopedia in our mind. No, you're supposed to be able to work it out, but to apply it to different situations. That's the concept of being a chokhom. So the members, they have to use their mind as well, according to the framework given in the halakha, given by the oral tradition. So it's very important also. That's why, what do we find? We find like this, there are people, when they're starting to learn Torah, they, um, they learn a lot of things by heart and by reading, fine. But if they don't enter properly into really stretching their mind through discussion, they don't get tied to it. When you've got to have something that you've got to try to understand and you're filled with questions, you've got to find the answers, then you're going on the right track. And that's what the Gemara develops. You can't really learn, uh, 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 like, there's some, there's some places where the educational program was to, to analyze the Torah Shebertav, what's written in the Chumash, and to read the Gemara. In fact, I once had a student who said he wants to go through the whole Talmud at that time, but there wasn't art school yet. So he, so he said he doesn't want to join this shiurim where he tried to work out from the Hebrew. It's, it's Hebrew is too difficult for him. And therefore, he sat down most of the day with a Sonsino translation and read through one tractate after the other. Well, that way, I don't think it would ever really understood even two lines of Gomorrah properly. But Gomorrah, you've got to understand what's behind it. You've got to use your mind. And one, once you start using your mind, it also gives you motivation. You want to try and get to the bottom of things. You want to try to understand what's, 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 what's taking place here. So this is, this is, this is, it also included here this question, my Chanukah. What's the deeper meaning of Chanukah? What's behind it? So, uh, that's the concept of now, I'll tell you a hint here as well. Let's go on, let's go on there from this passage and try to analyze it more deeply. It says, the tonorabona. Now, we can turn what tonorabona mean? What tonorabona mean? The teachers. So, I want to tell you, this is not the simple. Tonorabona is an introduction to a Mishnah or a brighter, generally a brighter. Yeah? <coughs> because if the mission is Tanan, <coughs> Tanan is the, <coughs> is the compilation of the mission. <coughs> Ton Rabbonon, the sages were learning Tanu. It is made for Shanu, Vishinamta. Tananda comes to do Shanu to learn, to repeat. You learn by repeating. Because to, to memorize, you have to repeat. To the Rabbonon, repeat it. Rabbon and learned. Now, I'll tell you a hint here. You could say, what does Hanukkah teach us? That you've got to learn. You've got to, got to learn things thoroughly. Because if you don't learn, you have to keep the light burning. The light of Hanukkah is referred to by the prophets, and all that, which is just quoted, Baruchi, what's the spirit of Hashem? is the words of the Torah. So you have to learn it. You have to light the lamp. That means you've got to kindle your mind. You've got to get enlightenment. As we say, the, the oil of the menorah brings light and warmth. You've got to warm your heart and your emotions to become more kind and you've got to enlighten your mind to Remove the darkness. And that's a duty for the person and a duty for the nation. It's the basis of the nation. But then they explain, Bukhafi Bukislev, the twenty fifth Bukislev, Yumit the Khanaka Tamdi Inum. This is this is the old scroll, Gilatanit, which Rachi quotes also is for take from the scroll which mentions all the days when you may fast and the days when you may not fast. So the, te the eight days of Hanukkah, the Lord of Misvodan, you're not allowed to make a funeral eulogy, or the Lord of Anubahan, 
and you're not allowed to fast on them, because there is a festival. Because when the Greeks entered the Holy Temple, they made all the oils of the Temple impure. And when the kingship of the house of Hasmoneans became strong, and they were victorious over the, the Greeks, they made a search, they only found one jug of oil, which is placed there with the seal of the high priest. And it only had in it enough oil to kindle for one day. A miracle occurred, but leak of men is money I mean. And that was kindled for eight days. It's a miracle. The miracle of the eight days. The Shanacheret, Vaum Vasum Yamim Tovim, next year they fixed and made it into holy days, good days, or festivals. Bahalel, by declaring the praise giving chapters from Tehillim, the Hoda'a, and the Thanksgiving prayer. That's in short. But every part of this is filled with questions. So now I'll just ask you a few of the questions. Now, was it fake? Was this miracle necessary even? What would have been, what would have happened if they would have delayed it for eight days? So what's, what's, what's the difference? Once you've got the victory, and you have the only one to make a celebration when you've got pure oil to kindle the menorah. Well, so wait eight days, it doesn't matter. And then uh, they, they could easily have used dinner wicks than usual. If they're so particular, straight away to have enough oil, they have enough oil, they didn't have enough pure oil. But they had a certain amount, and generally speaking, they had pretty thick wicks for the candelabrum which is in the temple. So make each wick thinner. Divide them to eight as you could do. It can happen, can happen sometimes. You might in Hanukkah find <coughs> you haven't got so much oil as you need. So you can take the regular wick and make it thinner and use it. So good enough. And the whole matter, why, why was the why was it so important to kindle the menorah? The fact that they were able to become victorious and take out the impure idols from the temple and they could start getting the temple ready, that was enough reason for celebration. So the whole thing needs, needs deeper understanding. Why this is Hanukkah? There were so many, there were hundreds of miracles. <coughs> the Greeks were so strong and they were very weak. They were able to, the great miracle was the miracle of the many, that is the few. Just like, if we just think back, the miracle of the Six Day War, the enormous miracle. And you just, <coughs> at the time, in fact, I've got different news reports from different newspapers, hundreds of miracles added up to the great miracle. Even now, the great miracle of the last war we had with Hamas, it's also a great miracle, but not just one miracle, hundreds of miracles. They all add up to a great miracle. If you compare the forces they had, and the number of missiles they shot, and so many were saved. So this needs further explanation. We will, so we're going to deal more deeply with this being the basic record in the whole of the Talmud for the fantastic transformation of the state of Judea, Judea almost disappearing and becoming so much of a Hellenistic state and so many Jews became completely assimilated to the ways of the Greeks and a small band changed the whole situation and were able to overcome the forces that came 
with huge, uh, in, huge number of soldiers with latest weapons, with elephants fighting a small band of Asmoneans, they were able to bring back independence, especially also religious independence, to the Jewish people. So that needs an explanation. So we'll deal with that the next year. Do you have any questions? Apart from all those we've already raised.